Well, I'm very glad that you're, you're, you deem it worthwhile to applaud a loser. And uh, politically, uh, I've, come, I've been assigned the task of talking to you about uh, fairness and uh, justice in the economy. And I was wondering how to go about it. And the first thing that came to my mind is, why don't I illustrate what I think is, and uh, with the purpose, of course, of stimulating the discussion, what I think is unfair today in the world as a way of defining uh, unfairness. First of all, to tell you that uh, I believe, generally speaking, that a market economy system is the best system that we've come up so far. I think it's in great dangers because of its inequities of actually failing all of us in different parts of the world. I think it's a crisis moment. I do think, however, that it soundly defeated feudalism, patrimonialism, tribalism in a great part of the world, and of course, in the last 20 years, uh, communism. But it uh, also was built over a time of great confusion, and many of the people who actually built it and structured it did not uh, write books, and so we haven't read very much about it. But they actually introduced inside the system mechanisms for it to be fair, because in the first part of the 19th century, when capitalism was booming, uh, there was a lot of inequitable stuff going on. Many people were left out. There was a result, big uh, social revolutions, and not only social revolutions, uh, there were also long recessions. Recessions lasted 10 to 15 years. And as a result of that, a lot of reformers acted, especially in the last part of the 19th century, and decided that ethics were an important part of the whole thing. And they were people like uh, Coquelin in France and Brickdale in the, in the United Kingdom and Ugen Hubert in uh, Switzerland, and their idea was the basis of a market economy, as defined both by Marx and Smith, is essentially a division of labor. And division of labor means that you cooperate. And if you cooperate, it means that fairness is an issue. If everything that was done was done by just single persons, the issue of fairness wouldn't come up. But we have to collaborate. We divide labor. As you know, whether you're talking about a Swiss watch with 620 pieces, whether you're talking about a Swiss pencil, Caron d'Ache, that's got wood from Germany and that's got uh, lead from Sri Lanka, you're always talking about combining things. And what capitalism has done the best, and a market economy has done the best, is bring resources from various sides and relate each of these resources to each other in such a way that it is clear who owns what, who owns what, and who is accountable for what. And that was the reason why it's only in the end of the of the 19th century that outside from looking at the problem of the division of labor, Europeans and Americans started looking at the issue of binding, which is if we divide labor, how is all of that brought together again? And what they invented, or what you invented, was what was called, what I call the public memory systems. In, in exchange for people being able to accumulate capital and accumulate wealth, it had to be recorded. We had to know who owned what, who mixed what with what, to make sure that everybody was accountable, that we all knew what was going on, that the statistics did effect, reflect what was, what was uh, happening, and that money would not be created in excess, and that movable paper that could cancel debts was also not created in excess. That was both a concern, by the way, of Thomas Jefferson and Marx. They said one of the problems about the capitalist system is that once in a while, it gets out of hand, it goes into the world of fiction, and it creates fictitious capital. That is to say, wealth that is actually not anchored to anything real. It is hyper-reality. Uh, and it's a hyper-reality similar to the film called Matrix, which is it makes you travel in a world that has nothing to do with what's going on. And I think that there are, in that sense, two big crises today that are more economic and that actually are, uh, to my mind, some of the things that this wonderful initiative created by Christopher and Elizabeth should look at very strongly, because at least seen from my third world point of view, they indicate that we are going into some very hard times, even worse than those that exist today. And that some of them are shrouded in uh, images and words that do not, um, oops, I was trying to look at the time and I don't see it there anymore, but uh, it'll, keep it'll keep coming up. Okay. Uh, it, this is very important for somebody south of the borders myself. So uh, the, the, there are two things which 
are shrouded and don't look quite correct and yet are extremely simple. One is what's going on today in the Middle East. What's going on today in the Middle East, uh, as some people call it, the Arab Springtime, looks like it is essentially a political problem. I have a feeling that it's to a great extent an economic problem. And one of the ways to find this out, we all have our own particular managers, <coughs> manners of uh, investigating or researching, is finding out what was on the minds of those who started it. As you may know, this all basically started in uh, Tunisia, and it started on a, uh, on a December the 17th, when Mohamed Bouazizi, in the small rural town of Sidi Bouzid, in Tunisia, self-immolated himself. Now, he self-immolated, it means that he burned himself. He was a street vendor. And uh, what we've done is we've put a team of Peruvian informologists, that's to say people who look at street vendors, in Tunisia to investigate the family, to talk to them, and find out what it is that motivated this man. To remind you, he immolated himself on the 17th of December, died on the 4th of January, but by the 14th uh, of January, so many other people were immolating themselves as well that the government started plunging into a crisis and uh, the crystal seed that was Buzazi started provoking people moving all the way from Morocco into Syria. He immediately toppled the government of Ben Ali, who was then substituted by another president who was then toppled again and right now they're trying to head towards new elections and there is a great amount of insurrection all throughout the Middle East. So the question now is what made this man move and why did he inspire, in spite of the fact that there have been rebellions for a long time now, why was it precisely that kind of a person that made things uh, uh, go the way he did? Why was a man so frustrated and uh, that he actually had uh, decided to bring down, uh, to, to, to suicide himself. Well, the thing is, his father was a squatter. He had land, but it was not property titled. It belonged to the municipality. They signed a, an agreement with uh, the father. The father dies. The mother bar uh, marries the brother-in-law. Once they're ma they married, they cannot register the title because it has not been approved by law. It cannot be used as collateral, so the son is unable to pass his cart into a pickup, which is what he wants. He can't make collateral credit. He is called a personne physique because he's not a personne juridique. He can therefore cannot create collateral from his assets. He cannot form capital. He cannot relate to utilities companies. He cannot be identified. Uh, he has no occupation authorization. And as a result of not having occupation authorization, his stall is con continually harassed for bribes because he does not have a carte de commerciant détaillant ambulant. He cannot record himself and his business, and he's continually being expropriated. And at the last time of his expropriation, uh, he, of course, uh, complains. He is slapped in the face. He finds that there is absolutely no future and commits suicide. Now, that's a story that people can relate to. And why do people relate to that? Because he is in the situation, according to our figures, of 85% of all businesses in Tunisia. 85% of all businesses in Tunisia do not have any of those things which you Europeans and elite Peruvians like myself consider basic, simply an identity and something that allows you to create credit and to create capital. Regarding his squat, the land that he was squatting on that he could not convert into capital, into credit, it's about 70% of the situation of all real estate in Tunisia. When you go, of course, to Tunisia, you find that the figures about unemployment are high because you wonder where these people were all the time, and you find that everybody, that if you take most young people from the age of 15 to 29 years old, uh, they 40% uh, of them are unemployed. But that's not possible because, you see, being a Peruvian, I can tell you, if you're unemployed, after one month you're dead because you can't feed, because you starve. So it's obvious that that 40% is really the black market economy, but it is a mar black market economy that is, that is acting without any of those legal institutions that you put up in Europe and that allow you to incorporate yourself, that allow you to identify your assets, that allow you in a simple piece of paper to know what you own and to know what you don't own. And the same thing happens in Egypt. We've worked in Egypt now for five years. 92% of all businesses are 
extra legal and and 86 percent of excuse me 92 percent of all real estate is extra legal it is does not correspond to what's in the books and 86 percent of all businesses are extra legal and in libya 90 percent of all real estate is extra legal and 85 percent of all businesses are extra legal the people therefore who moved inside uh, in inside those countries are essentially small businessmen on the street without any of the support of law that allows you to triumph in an economy. And therefore, you can actually see it when you look at the different, um, uh, you, you look at the, the, the different uh, statistics, uh, the, the, the developments in, uh, in the Middle East today as the political agenda starts falling to economic agenda. People talk about unemployment, about not being able to get ahead. If we don't address the issue of economic fairness, because these people are not seen as being part of the system, it, this, this situation will continue, it will affect us, and it will affect us through oil, and will affect us also because it's an hu hu enormous human mass. In the West, uh, the situation uh, since we last talked has actually gotten worse, as far as I can see. I do not see how the West is going to be able to uh, survive, among other things, because of an issue of fairness. Fairness means essentially the capacity to, as we said before, compare one person to another, know what their relationships are, are making accountable, and they allow you to adjust your macroeconomic instruments towards uh, uh, to, to making sure that you've got your money and your liquidity uh, in sync with economic reality. At that time, last year, this time last year, we had talked about the fact that the West had produced in a, a new economic instrument called derivatives over $700 trillion. And it's the first time in the history of the West that there is no record of where they are, and there still is not any record of where they really are, what they're worth, and who's accountable for them. The one of the characteristics of the West that made it, as far as I'm concerned, uh, the, the, the spearhead of development in the world is because every asset is rule-bound, it is public accessible in registries, you've got balance sheets, everything is recorded, you know who, where people are, where their marriages are, how much stocks exist, how much commercial paper exists, how many deeds exist, how many ledgers exist, where are the contracts, who are the patents, who owns the movie rights to a story, who's got the promissory notes, who owns the land, who owns the buildings, who owns the boats, who owns the machines, who owns the books, and who owns the pets? But you don't know who owns the majority of the liquidity of the West anymore because they're derivatives and it's the first time in the history of the West that you've got a piece of paper that is not recorded. And $700 trillion is a lot of money. You now have that the GNP of the United States is $15 trillion. You have got that uh, uh, the uh, GNP of the whole world is $60 trillion. And the amount of derivatives which are unaccounted for and which is the reason that nobody trusts their banks and nobody trusts their governments is $700 trillion. European and Western governments have approved a series of measures to correct this, none of which required that the $700 trillion be traced. You now no longer have, as opposed to, for example, as Latin Americans, one balance sheet per entity, banks. My entity, my bank in Peru has one balance sheet. And so you can know through balance sheets which were developed all the way from the 15th century Pacholi until what they are today, you can know what a company owns and how all those relationships fit together. But Enron, for example, failed, and when they failed and they finally tried to pick up the balance sheets, they found out it had 3,500 balance sheets. You now go to your bank and you ask yourself, well, is it in a good state? And they said, yes, look, we've cleaned up our balance sheet. And you say, well, that's one balance sheet. Everything's here. No, we have a second balance sheet. We call that a bad bank. You have ceased to reflect in the West, literally, what is the size of economic reality. Just now in the United States, when all of the mortgages had been bundled into different groups and they've tried to find out now to collect all those subprime mortgages that hadn't paid up, over 60% of them cannot be collected because they are no longer recorded in the names of the people or the banks that handed them out because to facilitate securitization, all ownership was put into one entity and you no longer know who's accountable for what anymore and it looks pretty much like Tunisia and that's a lot of the reasons why the value of the buildings is, are, are the value of the buildings are going now but it's not only reaches there it goes much further it goes to the point and I will end with this that you don't even know what countries have how much you don't know really what Greece's debts are 
because a lot of Greece's debts are based on derivatives, and these are currency swaps, whereby you take dollars, for example, you exchange them against, fr against euros, the euros come in and they look on the ledger as if it were an income of capital instead of actually being a debt. The result of all of it is that essentially European and American paper has ceased to reflect reality and therefore you don't know what's happening where and the only reason the system survives for the moment is it because it is supported by governments. So it's become a political, it's become a political system. It's become a system that's backed up by politics. In, in summary, and its conclusions, though I don't want to scare you at this, at this moment, in developing countries, the solution is not really in the hands, in hands of governments as much as it is in the hands of making entrepreneurship work by giving them the adequate legal instruments to function. Egypt, for example, has lost, according to its Minister of Finance, $3.5 billion as a result of the springtime revolution. And the World Bank is thinking of putting in a program of $1 billion this year, $1 billion next year. The United States says that it can come up with another $2 billion, and if needed, it, the international community should be able to raise another $2 billion. But the value of the informal economy in Egypt, as it stands today, the buildings, the machines they own, is $300 billion. In other words, what the entrepreneurs of Tunisia, the entrepreneurs of Egypt, the entrepreneurs of Libya have is enormously exceeds what any government has to help them out. So it is important to get that going because if it is not recognized as essentially being a revolution of small entrepreneurs, which is what they are, it can easily be labeled a revolution of politics and it can head in the direction either of a religious extremism or in the direction of Al-Qaeda. It's important to get in there and define that it is an economic problem. And in the global economy, the problem is really fairness means truth. Up until the end of the 19th century, Europeans and Americans managed to get every company in exchange for having the right to accumulate capital to declare it so that we all knew where they were and we all knew whether we were inflationary or we were deflationary and whether we could pay our debts. It now takes guts to actually face the financial sector and simply, aside from ethics, which is an important part of all, just simply tell the banks and financial institutions that it's about time we know how much they own and who they owe unto what and who's really broke so that they can break and we can all get along with our businesses. Thank you.